In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the carcinogenic chemicals. Before I get into today's video, please remember to click the link in the description of any of my videos. That'll take you to my Patreon page. For those who are unfamiliar with Patreon, Patreon is basically a website where you sign up to provide uh, monthly support, financial support of artists and creators that you really enjoy. So if you're enjoying the content that I'm putting out on YouTube and you're looking for a way to give back and support the channel financially, you can sign up to become a patron by clicking on the Patreon link. I really appreciate any amount of financial support that you're able to provide, whether that's one penny or a gazillion dollars. If you're a trust fund baby, it's really appreciated. And again, regardless of the number of people that sign up to support the channel financially, I'm still going to continue to put out these free videos. Um, with that said, let's get into today's video, which is on carcinogenic chemicals. Now of note, before I begin this video, I'm going to be releasing a practice question as part of my video question bank, which will be a practice question that corresponds with this video. So if you're looking for some practice, Keep an eye out for that video. It's going to be dropping very shortly, um, but let's get right into it. So today's video is on the carcinogenic chemicals. Now, I think the best way to approach the carcinogenic chemicals is to do a table. And I generally, if you've seen my videos, you've heard my little spiel before. I'm not a big fan of tables because I find them difficult to memorize, but this is an exception because there's 10 or so different chemicals that cause different cancers that you need to know some high yield notes about. So I'm going to fill in this table, but as I go, I will stress what's important, what's high yield, what you should keep in mind for USMLE, Comlex, and medical school exams. Um, the way that I want to approach this is I'll list the chemical, I'll list the cancer that it causes, give you the miscellaneous notes that you should memorize, and then if applicable, I'll give you my mnemonic for memorizing this, which is that column all the way to the right. So let's get started with aflatoxin. Aflatoxin causes hepatocellular carcinoma. You should know that this actually is derived from aspergillus. And the classic buzzword or association, if you will, that you should keep, an eye, uh, keep your eye open for on test day is that it comes from stored grains. The way that I remember this is by saying a flat liver. Now, aflatoxin starts with A flat. And if you look at the picture of a healthy liver, it has this really flat and smooth contour to it when it's healthy. So if, if you memorize a flat liver, it kind of helps you remember that aflatoxin or aflatoxin causes hepatocellular carcinoma when it becomes scarred and abnormal. So just memorize a flat liver for aflatoxin or aflatoxin. So that's our first chemical. Let's keep it going. Next, we've got the alkylating agents. So alkylating agents are just this large class of chemicals that you should keep in mind as causing lymphoma and or leukemia. Now, typically this is going to be a side effect of chemotherapy, which is interesting because you're giving somebody chemotherapy to treat their, their cancer and you're actually causing a different type of cancer. So lymphoma or leukemia is unfortunately one of the terrible side effects that can come about by getting chemotherapy when you're given an alkylating agent. The way that you can memorize this for test day is that you rewrite the word alkylating with two capital L's and that L stands for lymphoma and the second L stands for leukemia. So alkylating agent causes lymphoma and leukemia. So just to summarize and to keep things straight, so far we've got a flat liver caused by aflatoxins, which tells us that aflatoxins cause the flat liver to not be flat and therefore causes hepatocellular carcinoma. We've also got alkylating agents, and those L's in alkylating agents stands for lymphoma and leukemia. Now let's talk about alcohol. So I'm sorry for the really small text, but I wanted to squeeze this all into the chart. Alcohol causes squamous cell carcinoma of both the oropharynx and the esophagus. It causes pancreatic carcinoma, and it causes hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Because alcohol is typically one of the chemicals that people can memorize quite well, I really don't have a good mnemonic for it, so we're just going to kind of breeze through alcohol. On test day, usually, don't quote me here, but usually the question will not be asking you about alcohol because everybody obviously knows about alcohol and the adverse effects of alcohol. So if they're going to go after one of these chemicals and ask you a question, chances are it's going to be something else. 
Now we're going to talk about arsenic. So arsenic causes squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. It causes angiosarcoma of the liver, and it causes lung carcinoma. Arsenic, you should know, is actually contained in cigarette smoke. And the way that you can remember this is that instead of saying arsenic, you can say arsenicotine, which reminded me um, that arsenic is actually in cigarettes. So arsenicotine instead of arsenic cues you into the fact that it's contained in cigarette smoke. And then if you think about some of the adverse effects that cigarette smoke causes, the arsenic cancers are very closely related. So this is actually a great point to transition into our next chemical, which of course is cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke causes bladder, lung, oral pharynx, kidney, and esophageal cancer. And what you should really know for test day that's high yield is the part of the smoke that's carcinogenic is actually the polycyclic hydrocarbons. I've seen that come up in questions before. They could ask you this on your med school exams. It's just really good to know, and you'll sound smart at Thanksgiving dinner when you tell your crazy uncle to stop smoking. The mnemonic to remember this is the blokes smoking cigarettes. And blokes, B-L-O-K-E-S, stands for bladder, B for bladder, L for lung, O for oropharynx, K for kidney, and E for esophagus. So your blokes smoking cigarettes, they get all these different types of cancer, and the, mem the way that you memorize what type of cancer that is is by looking at the word blokes. So that's cigarette smoke. We're kind of cruising here. Let's keep it rolling and talk about nitrosamines. So nitrosamines cause stomach cancer, and nitrosamines are classically found in smoked foods and smoked meats. So on test day, look for the buzzword of smoked but the other thing that you might look for is somebody of Japanese descent. For whatever reason, Japanese people, they consume a lot of smoked foods, a lot of smoked meats, and there's a lot of nitrosamines in their, the staples of their diet. So a lot of Japanese folks do get stomach cancer due to the nitrosamine exposure. The way that I always memorized this was instead of saying nitrosamine, I said nitrostamine. And roast kind of reminded me of roasted or smoked food. So roast and smoked, you know, kind of similar in the culinary world. Um, but that's my mnemonic for it. And it's worked anytime I've seen a question on this. Let's keep it rolling, guys. You're doing great. You're memorizing. You're learning. I love it. Let's keep going. Naphthylamine. So naphthylamine causes urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. And this actually also comes from cigarette smoke. So if you go, you know, two rows up, you can see that for cigarette smoke, we said that it causes bladder cancer. And this is just the more specific version of that. So naphthylamine uh, causes the urothelial carcinoma. And again, this comes from the cigarette smoke. Don't really have a good mnemonic here. If you have one that's really good, drop it in the comment section so that other viewers can see the mnemonic. But I, I don't have one. So... Um, you know, I would appreciate any contribution that you guys have. Put it in the comment section. Next, we've got vinyl chloride. And vinyl chloride causes angiosarcoma of the liver. This is classically going to be seen in people that work in an industry that produces polyvinyl chloride pipes. And you may, you may hear that referred to as PVC piping. So a lot of us, especially here in the U.S., we have PVC pipes in our homes. These are kind of like plasticky looking pipes. A lot of times they're used in different plumbing applications, but on test day in the question stem, look for the occupational exposure from somebody who works with these PVC pipes. The way that I memorize this is I say liver cancer, and I emphasize the V in liver and the C in cancer. VC stands for vinyl chloride and also polyvinyl chloride to help me remember the, the occupational exposure. We're going to conclude today's video by wrapping up with chromium, beryllium, nickel, and silica. So these are chemicals that collectively cause lung cancer. And if you've gone through the lung section of your, your book or your question bank, you've probably seen that there's different types of interstitial lung problems that you get as a result of exposure to these chemicals. And over you know a long period of time, chronically, it can transition from any type of interstitial lung disease to actually full-blown malignancy. I don't have a good mnemonic here, so if you have one, please drop it in the comment section. But these four substances all cause lung cancer, so know them. And on test day, these will also be associated with some type of occupational exposure. So look for the questions that tell you about the type of work that the patient does. As a rule of thumb, just a quick aside while I'm talking about this, 
anytime a question tells you what a person does for work, they're either trying to get you to pick a certain answer or to rule out a certain answer. They don't just casually tell you what people do for work because it's a total waste of time on the test. So, you know, if you think about this really pragmatically, somebody who's being paid to write a question for USMLE or Comlex is not going to take the time to write a sentence or two about what the patient does for work unless that detail is relevant to rule in or rule out something. So if you see that, start to think about occupational exposures or some other type of high yield occupational association. Guys and gals, that's it for this video. Sort of quick, rapid review style, but it's important to know these associations because they do come up all the time. If you've got a question, a comment, put it in the comment section of the video. Please remember to subscribe to my channel. Check out the Patreon page if you want to support the channel. But that's it. Love you all. Keep up the great work.